Hi everyone, welcome to Beyond the Evidence. This is the channel where justice matters. My name is Barb. I am a true crime fanatic, and I love to dig deeper into the mysteries of unsolved cases. Join me as we search for missing persons, uncover the clues in unsolved murders, follow along with jury trials, and we'll be a voice for the voiceless. I'll share with you the facts, the theories, the clues, the evidence, and the controversies that surround these cases. This is Beyond the Evidence. Hello, everyone. Sorry for the issues. We have a lot of flooding going around, and it's crazy. Um, I'm going to bring Andrea on here. Andrea, how are you doing? I'm fine. Um, so we have 17 acres, and with all this snow and then with all the rain, um, the first acre is like flooded at the end of the driveway. Remember last year when I showed you? Yep. All flooded again. So it's affecting the internet. <laughs> hey Gloria, how are you doing? Kind of figured that's huh? probably what I kind of figured that's probably what it was. And it's snowing again. It just started about an hour ago. Are you and this kidding time me? everything's supposed to freeze tonight, so not good. Doesn't sound like it. No. Okay. So I need you to remind me. We started out with the certificate of analysis um, last time. Right. And we weren't going to do the additional supplement report because that was the report from that woman in Kokomo that had nothing to do with this against right. her boyfriend, right? Yes. Okay. Did we read the additional analysis and supplemental reports? Do you remember? Hmm. I don't think we did. Let me scroll down. I thought, okay, so we're on the one that has 59 pages, correct? Okay, what is the name of that one? Additional analysis and stuff. We're going to sell no report. Yes. Okay. So we went over the firearms as far as Debbie being the owner. Right. We have Michael's fingerprints. Did we read page six where it talked about Chris Hubbard yes um okay the guy from Cicero that yeah mm -hmm. and we read the thing with Adam Johnson okay right. The supplemental report. That's the one on um, when they went into the little daddies, and we read that. Right. That's and the next one is the um, report from the girl in Kokomo that has nothing to do with the case. Yeah, I'm not sure why. I think well, she because was they thought. That yeah, that they, they, they thought it had something. Right. Her boyfriend had something to do with it and then found out, right. nope. Right. Okay. Then we have 
and I'm not going to, we're not going to read through all these. I'm just going to tell you what we have. Um, we have a narrative with all the items, all the evidence. Which was what we pretty much read already. Yep. But it breaks it down even yeah, more. Yeah, tells what each, what each item was yeah. and a number and all that. Okay, so we read 21 and 22, 23 and 24. That was with the cigarette butts. Right. We read 25. We did 26. And 27. We did 28. Okay, I don't know that we did 29. So let's start there. Okay. Who's starting? Me or you? I don't remember if we did this one or not, so we'll start here. All right, everybody, we are continuing with Tabitha's story. Up until now, we have read um, the main suspects, depositions, and statements. We are going through the certificate of analysis and reading you portions of that that gives some information. We're not giving evidence out. Hello, Mark. How are you this evening? Um, and then we're just going to continue on and keep going. We've got two episodes this week. So um, if you could read that one, okay, that would be great. I can um, fix something on the video. Okay. Um, offense, missing person, date of report, 102402, County of Tipton. Victim's name, Tabitha Rains. Um, narrative continued from 0210-3616. Note, all evidence is logged in under case number, which, and then it gives the number, which was the case number I was originally given by Assistant Chief Alley. Wednesday, 102302. Myself and Sergeant Nystrom, ISP, went to Hankins Body Shop, 445 Sweetland Avenue, Tipton, with a search warrant to search a vehicle belonging to Jonathan Yates. We arrived at 70745 and processed vehicle. Red 1996 Chevy Z71 pickup truck, extended cab with a VIN number um, and, and registration number. Sergeant Nystrom photographed, did tape lifts of back seat and used a forensic vacuum. Luminol was sprayed on back seat and surrounding area. Positive reaction on passenger side rear seat and on the jack cover under rear seat. Seat and jack cover removed from vehicle. A wooden tonfa with hair stuck to it was found under the driver's seat. A utility knife was also recovered from the console as well as a knife sheath from the glove box. A small piece of body tissue was located in the right front wheel well. The tissue sample was recovered and sent to the lab for species identification. Once on station, I was notified by the lab that they only wanted the parts of the seat cover that had a positive reaction to the luminol. I discussed this with Chief Taco, who in turn discussed it with Prosecutor Lett. It was decided to cut out the section of the seat material where we had a positive reaction to the luminol, submit it to the lab for analysis, and return the rest of the seat to the truck. Monday, 10-28-02, transported items 36 through 39, 43, and 44 to the State Police Lab in Indianapolis for examination at 9.30 a.m. Monday, 11, 18, 02, transported item number 20 to the State Police Lab in Indianapolis for fiber examination and inventory. Tuesday, 12, 17, 02, accompanied Detective Stout, Officer Waymeyer, Trooper Huff, Sergeant Nystrom, Lab Technician Sean Tucker, and Nathan Presoff to 429. Northeast Street, Apartment B, Tipton, to search. And then it stops. 
Okay. So basically they were doing a search on Jonathan Yates truck. They found some blood. So they were trying to decide if they were going to take the whole seat, the seat or the seat cover, the seat. Instead, they just cut out the piece and sent it in for testing, right? That and skin tissue. And, and skin tissue. Okay. And hair gotcha. on the top. Yeah. So then it says, on Friday afternoon, October 4th, 2002, Detective Sergeant Stout informed me of missing person case he was investigating. He said Michael Rains reported his wife, Tabitha Rains, missing on Thursday evening, October 3rd. She had left her baby with her mother-in-law Wednesday at about 6.30 p.m., saying she was leaving with Kyle Neff to go to the hospital with Neff's girlfriend, Amanda Pratt, to see her grandmother, who was having surgery. She had not been seen or heard from since. After talking with Detective Sergeant Stout, I made contact with Officer Kevin Steiner and requested of him to come in and make some missing persons posters of her to be passed, to be distributed throughout the community. He made them and he and Assistant Chief Alley passed them out. We also placed her information in the locator computer and IDAX slash NCIC. I had Assistant Chief Alley contact Deputy Prosecutor Jay Rich and then Judge Nash to inquire about Ms. Raines being 16 years old and married, if she would still be considered a juvenile or an adult. Assistant Chief Alley informed me both felt since she was married, she would be considered as an adult. On Saturday, October 5th, at about 3.55 p.m., I was paged. Oh, 1.55, sorry. I was paged to contact the department right away. I called and was informed by dispatcher Frazier we had a report of a body in the Cicero Creek on the west side of the park by the baseball fields. Detective Tony Frawley of the Indiana State Police was with me at the time and we responded to the park. Upon arriving within a couple of minutes, Detective Sergeant Gary Stout and part-time officer Chet Netherton were mm -hmm. there securing the area with crime scene tape. Detective Sergeant Stout led us to the bank of the creek to where we could see the body. Officer Netherton said he did go into the creek and confirm it was a deceased body. After learning it was a body in the creek, I called dispatch to notify Brad Nichols, Tipton County Coroner, to respond to the scene. I also re requested dispatch contact Officer Kevin Steiner to respond to process the scene. Detective Frawley contacted his department to request their crime scene technician also. He also made other arrangements for services from their department and notifications. Later knowing Miss Rains was missing and the body appearing to be that of a young female, I had Officer Moses try to contact the family of Ms. Rains and a chaplain. I told him to take them to the city courtroom in the public safety building and wait with the chaplain. Once we removed the body and could identify it, we would meet with them, which the coroner and I did at about 7 p.m. While I think it's supposed to be at the scene, I observed the investigators and coordinated any needs of theirs. I remained at the scene and or in the area until I left the park at about 6.09 p.m. I met Coroner Nichols and other investigators at Young Nichols Funeral Home at about 6.22 p.m. 
we compared information given to us from the family of the victim to confirm the body being that of Ms. Rains. The coroner also removed some rings from her to show to the family to aid in, in identifying her. After leaving the funeral home, the coroner and I met with the family. They identified the rings as the victims. Let's see here. I lost my spot one second. Through the evening, the night, Saturday, and the early morning hours Sunday, I coordinated interviews for Detective Sergeant Stout and Detective Frawley, along with Detectives Tim Miller and Mike Tarr of the Indiana State Police, working until about 8 a.m. On Sunday, October 6th, I returned to work at about noon in the same role as before. I also handed, handled the media contacts. On Monday, October 7th, I continued to coordinate the needs of investigators, the media, and other administrative functions throughout the day. At about 5.23 p.m., Tiffany Boatwright called for Detective Sergeant Stout as he was unavailable. I spoke with her. She was returning a call from him. She said she heard about someone on a school bus making a comment about the case. She did not know who the person was. She could find out and call Detective Sergeant Stout Tuesday morning. I also contacted Bob Schultz, Assistant Superintendent of Tipton School Corporation, to see who this person may have been. He contacted me Tuesday and was not able to determine who it would have been. At about 5.40 p.m., Buffy Tate, the victim's mother, called and informed me her daughter, Tara, wanted to speak with us. She got on the phone and said one night between Wednesday, October 2nd, and Saturday, October 5th, she and Travis Clouser, her boyfriend, were driving in Kempton with her cousin, Nick Hall, when he asked them if he murdered or helped murder someone, if they would tell on him. They replied it depended on who it was and if he was the one who did it. I asked her if she felt he could be involved. She replied if he was coked up, he might. I asked if she thought he could kill Tabby and she, as she was his cousin. She replied she thought he would help. I told her I would pass this information to the detectives, which I did, and they would contact her. At about 6.08 p.m., Melissa Chandler called to say she had a friend named Renetta who works at Miller's Mary Manor, who told Melissa on Friday morning at about 1 a.m., Renetta works midnights, while on break outside in the back of the nursing home, she saw someone dressed in black running by the woods behind the nursing home. I tried to call Renetta. I left a message for her to call me. We finally made contact with Renetta Barney on Wednesday, October 9th. At about 12.08 a.m. Tuesday, October 8th, Justin Smith came on station to meet with me. He said he had heard John Yates was the one who pulled the trigger. Kyle Neff, Amanda Pratt, Wes Miller, and Paul Vasquez were also involved. He also added Liz Balser was by the courthouse Wednesday evening with two guys who were staying at the East Street Inn who said they were painting the town. He assumed they meant either painting a building or partying. I passed this information on to the investigators. On Tuesday, I also spoke to Kaysen Wall. Is that Wall? Wall. At, Tip Wall. Wall. Mm -hmm. at Tipton mm -hmm. Middle School at about 10.55 a.m. He was one of the people who found the body in the creek. After speaking with him, I went to Tipton Elementary School and spoke with Vincent McKinney, the other person fishing with Wah. I asked them to tell me again about finding the body, which they did. 
they told me essentially the same as they told the investigators after they discovered the body. I also spoke with Paul Vasquez about noon. He came to the department to see Detective Sergeant Stout, but he was unavailable to talk to Vasquez. Vasquez told me no one was talking with him since word on the street was he was a suspect. I also received a call from Gwen Clark, an employee at Marsh. She said Kyle Neff was in the store Monday evening at about 8.30 p.m. inquiring if the store had rabbit ears for a TV. She said she did not think he bought anything, left the store getting into a car, the one seen described. I know to be his car. A person named Pat McKinney of Kokomo called me at about 12.15 p.m. He said a female named Jennifer West had just left his residence after watching the noon news. After the story relating to our case, Jennifer made the comment a trailer belonging to Desiree Green. Jennifer said she was at Green's trailer when another girl came and said she was the one who shot the girl. Then she wouldn't say anything else and left. I gave this information to Detective Raleigh, who followed up on it. I also received a call at about 2.20 p.m. from a person who refused to give her name saying she was at the Tipton County Port Festival when she heard the victim and Amanda Pratt arguing. They were arguing over $60. Tabitha fronted Amanda for pills that were never delivered. After Tabitha left, Amanda made the comment, I'd kill that bitch if I could. The caller also added, that she had spoken to the victim a few weeks after the festival when the victim told her that they were still fighting. As with all information, this was given to the investigators. Okay, so I'm going to stop there. This is information in these pages, Andrea, where we don't have statements or depositions on some of these people. Right. Right. Why am I hearing an echo? I don't know. I'm not hearing an echo. I am. So basically in this information, we get the, the original story that she left at 630. She was supposed to go with Kyle Neff to the hospital to see Amanda Pratt because her grandmother was having surgery. This is the first time we've heard she was having surgery. All the other times we were told it was because she wasn't going to make it through the night. Right? Well, we were told that she was having, she was in the hospital and she wasn't going to make it. Yeah. But right. nothing was said that she was just having knee surgery. Right. Um, let's see here. And then... Okay, so they talk about finding her body, identifying her. Everything else that he said, we've, we've already discussed. It's the, the fact that some of the people that he mentioned, like Justin Smith, we don't have a deposition from him. We don't have a, dep a deposition from the Jennifer girl. We don't have one for this Miss Melissa Chandler called to say she had a friend named Renetta. We do right. have Renetta's. Right. Um, we don't have a statement from Pat McKinney. No. So Justin Smith, do you know who he is? 
the name sounds familiar, but there's a lot of Smiths and Tiffin, so. And we do have okay. Tiffany Boatwright's deposition. Yes, we do. We we do not. Um, okay, so the two, we don't have statements on the two individuals, the the miners, the founder. Um, but I, and I think one, And I talked to one of them and they refuse to talk. They don't want to, they don't want to rehash all of it again. And, and I can understand that. They were so right. young at that time. Right. So Paul Vasquez. I think that's interesting as far as this Justin Smith said that he heard John Yates was the one who pulled the trigger, but that Kyle Neff, Amanda Pratt, Wes Miller, and Paul Vasquez was there. And according to depositions, they were Wes Miller and Paul Vasquez was at either Paul Vasquez's or Glenn Long's trailer. Yeah. Mark, do you think Justin would talk to me? I would like to talk to him and get more of what he knows because we do not have a statement from him. So if you can arrange that, that would be great. Um, but he specifically called out those people saying Amanda Pratt was there. Right. And the whole thing that bothers me in all of this is that the whole premise of getting Tabitha out of the house was so that Tabitha could go with Amanda. But we all know that just weeks before this, she made the comment, if I could, I would kill her. Right. So you can't tell me that Amanda and Tabby made up. Maybe in Tabby's mind they did, but not in Amanda's. What do you think about that, Andrea? That's... That's the original story, but we've also heard and been told that that could have just been a ploy to get out of the house to go to a party. But then Roberta has said if she wanted to go party, she could have just told her. Yeah. And she would have left the house and went to yeah. the party. And Roberta would have watched the baby. Right. So why lie? This whole premise of getting her out of the house just does not make sense. Could it be that since she was supposedly leaving with Kyle, who we've read before that she was having extramarital affairs with, that she didn't want Michael to know that she was leaving with Kyle to go to a party? And that's why she told Roberta she was going to the hospital. Yeah, but she probably thought she would be back before Michael got home from school. Yeah. I know that they're saying that they made up. But I'm having a hard time believing that with the statements that we hear Amanda made. Right. Just before. Yep. You're not just going to forget those feelings and make up with somebody. And especially reading, her, reading Amanda's statement where she said, yeah, she probably would have been jealous had she saw Tabitha and Kyle together. Right. She knew they were just friends, but...
but knowing that they were probably having relations. She knew what was going oh, on. Oh yeah, she did. In my book. Yeah. She knew. Yeah, I would I don't doubt that at all. Because otherwise she wouldn't have made the statements that she made about if I could, I would kill that right. bee. Mm -hmm. And that's not the first time that you're going to hear that no. in a statement. Right. She made that statement multiple times. And also saying that she wasn't going to take her husband. Right. That's what tells me she knew what was going on. Right. She may not have seen it yet, but she knew that it was going on. Okay. Who is Desiree Green? Do you know? Because that's it Liz says a that girlfriend from Little Daddies. Okay. So Pat McKinney of Kokomo called said a female named Jennifer West. Now, who's Jennifer West? I don't know. Mm. It's another Had one just left have. his residence. Jennifer made the comment, a trailer belonging to Desiree Green. Okay, so that was Elizabeth's girlfriend. Yeah, Desiree Green Jennifer's, was Elizabeth. Okay. Jennifer said she was at Green's trailer when another girl came and said she was the one who shot the girl. So we're assuming that that is Elizabeth. Right. Who made that statement? Who's made that statement a thousand times? A thousand times. Right. In, in, in public places. Yes. To a lot of people. Especially when she's been drinking. Right. And what happens when you drink? You tell the truth. <laughs> so we don't know the person who heard this at the pork festival, but it's very clear that this person but I think is in saying, one of our other I think in one of our other depositions there is a name. But I don't okay. think we've read it yet. We haven't read it online. Okay. I'd kill, yeah, if I could. Okay. And it says the caller also added that she had spoken to the victim a few weeks after the festival. When is the pork festival, Andrea? It's the weekend after Labor Day. So it's either so this, usually the fourth, fifth, or sixth. So this would have been September. Yeah, September. It would have either been, let's see, the eleventh, twelfth, and thirteenth is the pork festival, or it's or the six, six, seventh, and eighth. So it, this would have been, let's see, two weeks after would have been at the end of September. Okay. So this is all at the at the end of September that. This person heard Amanda say this, and it says, the vic um, I spoke to the victim a few weeks after the festival, and she said they were still fighting, so this is still at the end of September. Right, and she said Tabby, because she says the victim. She talked to the victim. Right. So right. she talked to Tabby, and Tabby said that they were still fighting at the end of September. Right. right. Okay. Now, I'm going to continue on. Or do you want to read for a little bit? I can read. It doesn't matter. You're probably better at these names than I am. Okay. Ed Amick from Elwood called at about 3.40 p.m. saying he works with Wes Miller at State Plating in Elwood. Miller had taken a knife to work and was putting it through a process they call pickling. He said the purpose was to clean the knife. He also added Miller has stated he was going to sue the police over going to his residence to talk to him. He also said the victim's head was underwater when she was shot in the back of the head. 
He also said she was killed because she was going to turn someone in for stealing drugs in Kokomo. I gave the information to investigators. Well, we know that's a okay. farce because she wasn't shot in the back of the head. Okay. So I was going to say that is huge. Um, and we know a knife wasn't, we don't, and we've never heard a knife was used. So right. what is this whole pickling with this knife? Yeah. I mean, that's just somebody talking out, trying to be a big shot, it sounds like. Yeah, because we, we can refute that she was not shot in the back of the head. Right. And she had no stab wounds on her. She was going to turn someone in for stealing drugs in Kokomo. Why, why wouldn't police look into that more? Probably because there's not a lot of people in Kokomo that she was that she hung around with. All the people that she hung around with were lived in Tipton. Right, but doesn't mean that somebody from Tipton is the one that stole drugs in Kokomo. Yeah, true. I mean, to me, that's a big statement right there. That goes towards motive. And everything else is this stupid motive that Jay Rich is trying to sell, which is that she, she, Tabitha stole cocaine from um, Elizabeth Balser. Okay, go ahead. Mike Brown came in at about 4.07 p.m. He said a dancer at Little Daddy's in Kokomo, Heather Bess, had just told him Liz Balser was in Little Daddy's Monday night with a skinny male. Liz told a dancer she had had a tape that had the killing of Tabitha on it. The skinny guy also stated he was involved. I gave this information to the investigators. Now, we have heard about this tape. Mm -hmm. existing right and in fact someone who was going to pass on this tape was then involved in a motor vehicle accident and said tape disappeared and that person passed away in the accident right I would like to know where that tape is. Yeah, wouldn't we all? Gloria, thank you so much for the, the sticker. I appreciate it. She had multiple other issues, such as very possible stab wounds, bruising, etc. I didn't see no stab wounds in the autopsy report. Well... I think she had what, other injuries, yes, but but I think what he's referring to is we we still don't know what exactly happened with her throat and the shoulder. They say it was a bullet, right? Or was it really? That's my question. Was it really? Well, but that's two distinctive injuries. I mean, you're going to tell, you can tell the difference between a knife wound and a bullet exit. Well, you would think so. Yeah. And the only other injuries, only other marks that she had on her neck was the bruising. Mm hmm And then her cheek from the pistol whipping or whatever they want to say it was. Yeah, that whole side of her face. Right. But other than that, there was no other injuries on her body. That we can tell so far. Right. I would love to have the pictures. 
you know how the invest um the whoever does the the corner has the pic the pictures of the front and the back of the body. Yeah. And they mark where all the injuries were. Right. I would love to see that. Yeah. Well, but the, we we had the we had the forensic pathologist and the and the coroner's report, and they right. list the injuries. Can't hear you. I didn't say anything. I'm thinking. Oh, okay. I thought I saw your mouth move. <laughs> you probably did. I was chewing on a French fry. Oh, okay. You want me to read on? Yeah, go ahead. At about 4.25 p.m., Derek Boyd was on station to see Detective Stout. As he was busy, I spoke to Boyd. Boyd said he, Dwayne Frazier, and Matt Glover were all at the city parking lot next to Mosier's Jewelers and the Diana Theater. The night the victim was last seen, October the 2nd, he saw John Yates' red truck stopped at the traffic light at Independence Street which is right in front of the Diana Theater. He okay. said Yates was driving, Liz Balser was in the right front seat, Tabitha Raines was in the right rear seat, and he thought Lindsey Groves was in the left, the left rear seat. He said Yates and Balser both spoke to him as the window was down in the pass on the passenger door and he could see in the truck. He also added after Balser initially spoke with the investigators, he spoke to her. She seemed worried and scared. He agreed to return at 7 p.m. to see Detective Stout. Okay. But he doesn't give a time. I wish they would have gotten a time. We have his, we have his, we have his deposition. And he does oh, give that's a time. right. We do. Okay. He did give a time in his deposition. Okay, go ahead. Mike Brown returned at about 4.35 p.m. Heather Bess was with him, and she told me the same as Brown had earlier. She also had more details about Monday night at Little Daddy's. We spoke, and I asked her to return at about 8 p.m. to speak with the investigators, which she did. She spoke with Detective Stout and Frawley. At about 5.30 p.m., which I don't think we have... Heather I was state. just going to say, I don't think we have buses. No. At about 5.30 p.m., Ashley Tittle came to see me and said she was told by J.J. Reed that Liz Balser was bleaching the bottom of her shoes. She did not know if he saw it happen or if someone told him or where it happened at. This was passed into the investigation as investigators also. Yeah, and in the depositions, we'll hear more about bleaching the shoes. Right. Okay, my question is, you have to keep me straight on all these people. Okay. Who's Ashley Tittle? She's the one that lives, um, okay, sh hang on a minute. Ashley Tittle, okay, she is, she know, is she's deceased right now. She mm -hmm. died from a drug overdose, I, if I'm remembering correctly. And okay. she was part of the the drug scene in Tiffin. What about J.J. Reed? J.J. Reed is the one that was pulled up and supposedly took Liz to Tabby's house. And they went to get a, a marijuana joint to take back to Liz's house or take back to Tabby's house, house. And he picked her up at Steel Parts Credit Union. Okay. Remember when they were out for their walk and he pulls up and yeah. Yep. Okay. Go ahead. On Wednesday morning, October the 9th, Pat Comer called and said he had heard rumors about the case. He wanted to tell us he had sold Debbie Neff, Kyle's mother, a 38 caliber Taurus model 85 revolver seven or eight years ago. He was going to try to find the serial number and call us back, which we have that. Right. At about 4.10 p.m., Renetta, it's Bainey, I think, and not Barney, called about what she had saw behind Miller's Mary Manor. I sent Officer Osborne to pick her up and bring her to the department as she did not have transportation. 
Detective Frawley and I spoke to her. She said, while on a break at about 1 a.m. behind Miller's, she saw a person dressed in all dark clothes, thin build, 5 foot 9 to 5 11, brownish color hair running from a wooded area on the west side of a dirt pile by a wooded area behind the nursing home. She said there were lights there so she could see fairly well. The person mm -hmm. exited the woods and ran east along the wooded area, followed the curve north, and she lost sight of him. She also added on Wednesday, October the 2nd evening, at about 6.30 or 7 p.m., she was passing papers. She also has a paper route at East and Armstrong Street, which is just to the north of where Tabby and Michael's apartment was. Right. As she approached the intersection, she saw Tabitha with the baby stroller talking with two or three, quote, boys, unquote, about 19 to 20 years old. She said Tabitha was upset. As she got closer, Tabitha walked away from, from her going northbound. She said they met and she stopped and looked at the baby. They made small talk about the baby and she could see that Tabitha had been crying as her mascara was running. They talked a few minutes and she continued on her paper route. Detective Frawley and I asked her to go with us to both areas and show us the locations she was speaking of, which we did. Okay. So this is very important because this is October 2nd, the day she supposedly went missing. And 6.30 or 7 o'clock. Right. And she supposedly left at 6.30. Correct. But this woman says she was between 6.30 and 7. She was walking with the stroller, with the baby in the stroller. Right. And who are these two or three boys? These 19, 20 year old kids. Right. Exactly. And she was, she was convinced that it was. October 2nd, the night that Tabitha went missing. Right. That she saw her walking Drake in the stroller. But right. yet, Tabitha left the house at 6.30 and went with Kyle Neff. She can't be in two places at one time. Right. One with the baby and one without. So that is a big contradiction. Then it says, on Thursday, October 10th, at about 8.27 p.m., I received a call from Jim Calibro from Kokomo PD. He said they had a female telling one of their officers, Lyle Myers, about some comments her boyfriend had made during a conference confrontation they had. She told Officer Myers in the early morning hours of Friday, October 4th, the boyfriend stated to her that he had killed someone. He was visibly upset and crying when he made the comment. He did not say who, when, or where. I asked Officer Calibro to contact Officer Meyer and have him call me. Officer Myers called at about 8.31 p.m., he said he was working in their substation in Gateway Gardens when the female, Ashley Peters, came in and told him the story about her boyfriend, Mark, how James. do you pronounce that? James. James. Um, he said the boyfriend was in the Howard County Jail on charges related to the dispute and other charges. I informed the investigators this information and Detective Tony Frawley spoke with Officer Myers a short time later. Detective Frawley, Sergeant, Detective, wait, Sergeant Tim Miller, and I went to the Howard County Jail at about 10.35 p.m. and spoke with Mark about the comments he made. After being Mirandized, he spoke with us. Eventually, he said he was on meth and went to his girlfriend's residence in his parents' van to pick her and her child up at about 5 a.m. Friday morning. He said he was going to take them to his parents' house to tell her 
he had made another girl, Jennifer Floyd, pregnant, and he wanted to be with that person. On the way, he stopped the van and they talked. He said he started crying and made the comment about killing someone. He was not sure why he said it, other than he was on meth for the first time and was messed up. He denied any knowledge of our case or killing anyone. After speaking with him, we returned to Tipton. Yeah, that's the one that we didn't read a while ago. Right. Because they found it nothing of importance. Okay. At about 8.38 p.m., Linda Moss called me concerning her daughter, Elizabeth Balser's car, which we obtained a search warrant for. I told her we were finished with it, and since it would not start, I would have it towed back to her residence, where we got it from, Friday morning, which was done. She also discussed Liz's involvement, or lack of, in the case. She said she had an alibi for her, for October 2nd and 3rd. She said she had two bank machine receipts from Key Bank in Kokomo, and Liz was with Rudy Ramos one of the times he was at the machine. I told her to bring me the receipts, and I would call the bank to check the video to see if Liz could be seen. At about 9 p.m., she brought the receipts to me. I made a copy of them and returned them to her. We all know that in Elizabeth's trial, which we're going to cover, but we do know that supposed photo evidence was shown to the jury showing Liz was at one of those bank ATM machines. But it never showed her face. Right. So how did they identify that it was truly her? Right. All right, go ahead. On Friday morning, October the 11th, at about 9 a.m., I called Cheryl Sears, the branch manager for the Key Bank branch of East Hopper Street. I gave her the information from the receipts, and she said she would check the tapes and call me back. She called back, leaving a message for me to call her. I called her back at about 12.30 p.m. She said on the transaction at 5.38 p.m., you can see the passenger in the car, and on the 8.34 p.m. transaction, would see the passenger's legs only. I made arrangements to meet her at about 2.15 p.m. to see the video. Upon meeting her at the bank at about 2.30 p.m., she did not show me both, she did show me both transactions. On the 5.38 p.m. transaction, you can see the passenger's face. I feel it was Elizabeth Balser. On the other transaction, you can see the passenger's legs. The person was wearing denim shorts and you could see legs. I asked Miss Sears if they could make me pictures of the person persons in both transactions. She said she would send it to the Fort Wayne office to the person who could do it. At about so eleven, they did see her. so they did see her a face. They saw a face, right? And he said a he face. felt like it was Elizabeth Balser. Right. Right. At about 11.15 p.m., Kathy Floyd came in to see me to report an argument she saw on October the 2nd between 10 a.m. and noon in the hospital parking lot. There was a shiny green Ford Bronco or Chevy Blazer type vehicle with a female driver, a female, a white male with shaggy sandy color hair that needed brushed, walked up to the female and they were arguing. The vehicle eventually drove away. Upon checking further, I was, it was I was told it was Adam Johnson's vehicle and he fits the description of the male person involved. This was also passed on to investigators. However, this was before the victim was missing and we have accounted for her whereabouts at different times during the afternoon. On Wednesday, October 16th at about 1040 AM, I called Melanie Hall at Sprint Spectrum LP to inquire about who to fax a subpoena to in regards to an account of Linda Moss. This phone was in her daughter's possession when she was arrested for public intoxication. She told me 
what 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 was needed. I called and gave the information to Prosecutor Lett, and he said he would fax the subpoena to them. At about 11.20 a.m., I also served a subpoena on Richard Tim at TDS Telecom for the toll records of Linda Moss's home telephone. On Thursday, October the 17th, he sent me the information via email, which we don't have those. No, we don't. I also spoke with Amy Gert, an employee, an an employer employment specialist with the Tipton County Office of Family and Children's Services. She is an employee of Carey Services who contracts with the Division of Family and Children. She said a client, Cindy York, was in her office on October the 9th. During their meeting, Ms. York told her she worked at Cheryl's restaurant until quitting July 2nd of 2002. She said while employed there, she was sexually harassed by Kyle Neff. She also added she knew Neff was the father of Tabitha Rain's son, as he told her this. She said her daughter, Angela Powell, was friends with the victim and had more information. I called Ms. York and scheduled an appointment for her with Detective Sergeant Stout at about 2.45 p.m. She did come in and speak with him, repeating what Ms. Gert had told me. She also added her daughter told her the victim was telling she was currently pregnant with Neff's child. She also said she would contact, make contact with her daughter to meet with Detective Stout. End of report. We do not have any of those statements. No. And all of that was from Chief Gordon Taco that we just read. Right. Right. Sorry, I forgot to do that in the beginning. No, it didn't say it in the beginning. Oh. I went back to check. Well, According to the autopsy, Tabitha was not pregnant. Right. So that maybe she thought she was and didn't know for sure. But in there it says... She knew Kyle Neff was the father of Tabitha Rain's son as he told her this. Right. If you remember right, Kyle said he wanted to take a DNA test. Yep. Yeah, I agree, Mark. They they didn't look at everything thoroughly. Okay. So, you yeah, if you want that? to. Okay. Uh, this was on 10-15-02. Patty Lettrell, 225 Southwest Street, Tipton. I'm not going to read the rest of that. Stated to Detective no. Stout that she is employed at the Tipton Hospital and approximately on the 1st or 2nd of October, she believed it to be on the 2nd, between 10.50 p.m. and 10.55 p.m. When going to work in the hospital parking lot, she observed a pickup truck, dark in color, newer looking, driving in the middle drive. She heard yelling and shouting, and then she observed the vehicle exit back out of the drive on the south side. There was no topper on the truck. And this is important because there were tire tracks right. in that area, correct? Yes. Tire tracks found. Right. But they didn't investigate who those tire tracks belonged to. Right. We have pictures of the tire tracks. Correct. Okay. At 8.17 a.m. on 10.702, Nancy Johnson came to the police department. Uh, she stated that Wednesday night, 10.202, at approximately 8.45 p.m., her and her husband, Wyatt Johnson, were walking in the park and in the area of the U-shaped drive. They heard what they thought to be shots coming from the back of the park and observed a red four-door vehicle, male driver, wearing a baseball hat, exit the park in a hurry. Second vehicle, white, gray, silver, coming from an area of shuffleboard, not available to give plate info, possibly 27B9227. Okay, so who do we know 
that drives the red four door, door vehicle. vehicle. That would have been the only red vehicle that has been mentioned is Jonathan Yates's truck. Right. Who do we know that <laughs> drives a white gray silver vehicle? Michael Rain. White gray silver man. Michael Rain. I thought his was tan. His might have been tan and Roberta's was white. But Liz's car was a was an orange color or a burgundy color. Right. And I want to point out everybody, this says this was at 8:45 p.m. Right. The official story has this all happening between what 10 and 10 30. Well, supposedly she got to the park at 9 30. Oh yeah. According to Andrew Bush. She got to the park yeah. around 9 30. And then 10 30 or so is when Kyle and Liz and Jonathan supposedly got there. Because he ran home by 11. Right. Now, I did talk to somebody that did state that on October 2nd, there was a group of individuals back by the baseball diamonds. Mm -hmm. One of those individuals was Michael Rains. Mm -hmm. who supposedly wasn't in town that night because he was at school. But a witness well, saw him in town at 5.30. Yeah, at 5.30. And people were going from that group, were going in and out of the park all the way up until 7, 7.30 when that individual left. Right. And it was a group of people, and they were drinking and had loud music playing. Yep. And the area that she's talking about is back by the baseball fields. Right. Just to the south of the pavilion area. Pretty much where it wouldn't be too far from where Her Tabitha was, was supposedly put in the water. Right. Well, where her body was found. Right. Next one. Yep. On 10602, Desiree Green came to the Tifton Police Department and gave a tape statement. Um, gives her address and her birthday. That stated that she went to lot 87 on Thursday, Chuck Green residence, and spent the night with Liz Balser. Donnie Bowman dropped Liz and Desiree off at Ryan's Steakhouse at approximately 5.30 p.m. on Friday, and Linda Balser, Linda Moss, brought Desiree and Liz back to her residence. Desiree stated that they stayed there approximately 15 to 20 minutes, then walked to Village Pantry, then to Dina Wright's residence to get some weed. Stated that they did smoke some weed at Dina Wright's residence. Then they walked to an area of the courthouse and got a ride back to Liz's residence with Tom McDaniel and went to bed. Saturday woke up around 9 a.m., smoked a joint, fuzzy, spent approximately two hours in bed. Hmm. Okay. Okay, so Mark says, Gary still told us there was video of that, but you couldn't make out in the video who was who. Too far away for the technology then. Gary Stelt told you that there was a group of individuals at the park that night? How, and where, where's the cameras at? Right. Because they didn't have cameras in the park that at that time. I'm wondering if it was at the hospital. Did he tell you where this camera supposedly was? Overlooking the hospital parking. That's what I kind of thought. 
So it would have been back by at that point in time, that's where the emergency room was. Right. And it was probably one of those round ones on the pole that right. didn't, was just enough to view, you know, show who was in the parking lot up close and everything else was fuzzy and blurry. That's interesting to know. Hmm. Ready? Yep. Okay. I don't know who this one's from. It'll probably say at the end. John Steiner. Okay. Okay. I'm going to read fast. Go for it. Okay. All evidence is logged in. Okay. I'm not reading that. On Saturday, 10502, approximately 14, 10 hours, I was notified by dispatch that a body had been found floating in Cicero Creek. In the Tipton City Park, I arrived at the scene at 1509 hours. I met with Officer John Moses, who at the crime scene entry log, who had the crime scene entry log. Okay. I entered the crime scene. As I walked north to where the body was located, I noticed what appeared to be a black sandal floating in the creek. I went further north and met with Chief Taco, Detective Stout, Prosecutor Tom Lett, and Coroner Brad Nichols near the area where the body was located. The body was located in the creek west of the baseball field, approximately 250 feet north of the water tower in the hospital parking lot. The, bottle, the body was floating face up with the head and legs under the surface of the water. The head was facing to the south. The arms were bent at the elbows and pointing up. The body appeared to have a gray shirt on. No other clothing could be seen. During a search of the area, a single black foam sandal was located on the creek bank near a large cement block west of the water tower, approximately 250 feet south of where the body was discovered. The other matching sandal was found floating in the creek between the body and the first sandal. Both sandals were collected and packaged separately. Sergeant John Nystrom from the Indiana State Police arrived on scene to assist me with the processing of the crime scene. Sergeant Nystrom photographed the scene while I videotaped it. A state police helicopter was brought in. The pilot took me up and I did an aerial video of the scene. The scene was measured and sketched by Trooper Bob Good and Sergeant, it doesn't say, myself and Coroner Nichols entered the water at approximately 1735 hours. I immediately noticed that the victim had a penetrating wound on her forehead just immediately, just above and right of her left eye. No other wounds were noticed at that time. Myself and Coroner Nichols searched the area about the body for any evidence. No, none was found. The body was placed in a body bag, put in the Stokes leader, removed from the creek, and secured by the coroner at 1741 hours. The scene was turned over to the coroner at 1800 hours. I arrived at okay, the coroner. Hang on. Hang okay, hang on. Hang on. In there, he specifically says all they noticed was the gunshot wound. Yep. What about the black eye and the bruises on the face and the neck? I mean, that all would have been visible. Oh, wait. Why is let me read on that? Work? Let me read on. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but this is at the corner. I know. This, now we're talking about the corner. I want to know why wasn't that listed? When well, okay, think when about this. He, he entered the water at 1735, and they removed the body at 1741. That's six minutes. Right. So what? They didn't look to no, see they that seen the, they seen the black they seen the gunshot wound. They seen the gunshot wound, said, oh, well, that's what happened. And they put her in a bag and they lifted her up into the bank. But this is false because it says there were no other injuries. Yeah, well, none that they could see. Apparently. Is he blind? Yeah, well. We've seen I mean, pictures, so. Come on. I know. They were visible to us. <laughs> Okay, I arrived at the coroner's office at approximately... We had crappy pictures and we could see it. Right. I arrived at the coroner's office at approximately 1830 hours. At that time, I took Polaroid photographs of the body. 
The body was positively identified as that of Tabitha Raines by the family from positive ID of the jewelry and tattoo on the right side, right hip on the body. The body bag was resealed to await an autopsy on Monday morning in Indianapolis. At approximately 2,000 hours, myself and Officer John Moses drove to the area of County Road 100 West and County Road 350 South, where a pair of women's underwear was seen on the road roadside. We located the underwear approximately approximately 300 feet west of County Road 100 West on the north side of 350 South. The underwear were multicolored, size large. The item was photographed at the scene and again on station. It was bagged and secured in the evidence bag or the evidence cage. The reason why I slowed down there is because that's almost the scene of where said person got into an accident that killed him. That supposedly had the tape. The tape. Yeah, it's a half a mile. It's a half a mile from there. Okay. Okay, Sunday, 10602. At approximately 1655 hours, I returned to the scene with Assistant Chief John Alley and searched the area with a metal detector. No new evidence was discovered. Monday, 10702, I attended autopsy at IU Forensic Pathology. Indianapolis, Dr. Peters performed the autopsy on Tabitha Raines. Also present were Coroner Brad Nichols, Deputy Coroner Rory Silvers, ISP Sergeant John Nystrom at the autopsy. I took photographs, took postpartum fingerprints, and collected the gray shirt that the victim was wearing. Dr. Peters did an autopsy diagram, collect the, there's the diagram you were talking about. Yep, I love to see the diagram. Yeah, collected samples for a victim sexual assault kit. The body was examined. There was, okay, here we go. There was a penetrating wound to the forehead above the left eye. There was also a puncture wound to the top and back of the right shoulder, as well as a small laceration to the throat near the jugular notch. During the examination of the head, a bullet was recovered from the back of the head, flaked off, and the bullet was visible. It was recovered by Dr. Peters, washed off, and I secured it in a pillbox for later examination at the State Police Lab in Indianapolis. The laceration in the throat and the puncture wound in the right shoulder was probed by Dr. Peters. The autopsy started at 0800 and was completed by 1045. The sexual assault kit was secured in the evidence refrigerator. The gray shirt was secured in the police department garage, hung up and allowed to dry. Okay, but it still doesn't mention anything about the black guy the bruising on the side of the head and on her jawline. Why aren't they stating this? I don't know. And they're calling it a puncture wound. Right. Not a bullet wound. But then the forensic pathologist said it looked like a bullet entry and exit wound. But he couldn't tell for sure. Right. He was say he he said that in his opinion, it looked like a bullet wound to the shoulder that exited through her neck. So if that's the case, she would have been shot twice. Once from behind and once from in front. Mark, this is all in the newspaper. All of the information we're giving out was in the newspaper during the trial. Okay. 10802. Myself and Sergeant John Nystrom transported evidence items to the state police lab in Naples for examination before leaving for the laboratory. We were informed that there had been a search warrant obtained for a vehicle owned by Elizabeth Balser. The vehicle, a red 1977 Buick Park Avenue. So they're saying it was red, but everybody else is saying it was orange. Was secured in the police department garage at 12 p.m. Myself and Sergeant Nystrom proceeded to process the vehicle at 4 p.m. and finished at 5.50. Nystrom photographed, sketched, fingerprinted the vehicle, as well as using tape lifts to try to obtain hair and fiber evidence. I used the forensic vacuum on the front and rear floors of the vehicle. 
Where are you at? On page 42. Oh, for the vehicle. Okay. Thursday, 10, 10, 02. Went to Tipton County Jail and recovered a pair of K-Swiss tennis shoes, white size 8, and a Sprint Samsung portable dual band phone model number from the property of Elizabeth Balser as per a search warrant for the same. The items were placed in individual paper bags and transported to the police department, where they were photographed, sealed, and placed into evidence. The left shoe had a right a red stain. The left shoe had a red stain on top, left side between the fourth and fifth eyelets. The right shoe had a scuff mark and a reddish stain on the left top side of the toe area. I was asked to go to the Tipton City Park and look at the area around the shuffleboard court where some of the family members found a brownish stain that they thought could possibly be blood. I met with Trooper Ron Huff, who had the area secured. I examined the area, took photographs of the area. I collected the brownish stain with a cotton swab and distilled water. The stain was a very fine powder. I determined that it was just a fine layer of dust and dirt. Friday, 10, 11, 02, I transported items to the State Police Laboratory in Annapolis for examination at 3.40 p.m., uh, Saturday, 10, 12, 02, the brown blanket was removed from the utility room. Okay, wait a minute. They've not said one thing about a brown blanket. No, I just caught that too. The brown blanket was removed from the utility room, taken to the police department garage, removed from the paper bag it was in, and hung up on a rack in the garage to dry. Blanket and blue shirt, which I removed from the locker number two, to dry on 10, 14, 02 were packaged in and placed in evidence on 10-16-02 after drying. Where does this brown blanket come in? If you remember, somebody said something about a blanket or a sheet that was out there. Somewhere in these documents, we read that. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm finishing this up. Notified by 10-15-02, notified by Detective Stout that Erin McCormick had a couple of firearms in her residence that she did not know if they were involved with this case and wanted us to collect them. Went to her residence and collected two handguns and ammunition for both. Collected a Smith & Wesson 357 model 65-5, serial number, blah, 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 and 13 38 caliber cartridges. I also collected a Cobra... Model DD-45 shot shells. These were all photographed, packaged, and placed into evidence. Detective Stout later told me that he had eliminated both handguns from the case. Upon further examination of the 357 revolver, I noticed that there was a lot of dust and a dead fly in the barrel of a gun, and the other gun was of the wrong caliber. Both guns were returned to their owner on 10-28-02. Thursday, 10 02 notified by Detective Stout that the residents of 233 2nd Street had found some what they believed to be blood droplets on the sidewalk in their backyard. I arrived and found eight red spots on the sidewalk. The spot where were low velocity spatters and appear that what whatever they came from was traveling west to east. The droplets seemed to be in a straight line down the sidewalk going from the back steps of the house to the garage on the west side of the garage. I photographed the spots and collected three of the spots using a sterile cotton swab and distilled water. I collected the spots at each end and one in the middle. All three were packaged and placed into evidence. Saturday, 10, 1902, contacted by ISP Trooper Bob Good that he had collected a pair of women's underwear on State Road 28 and approximately 400 West. I have photographed the item, bagged it, and placed it into evidence. End of report. John Steiner. All right. I think we are going to end there for tonight. And then we should be able to get through the rest of it on Thursday. On Thursday. Yeah. That's what I was I was thinking the same thing. Mark, I thought it was a sheet, not a blanket. 
Yeah. I don't remember anything about a brown blanket. Yeah, I don't either. I remember a sheet. And just to going back to to Tabby's injuries, you guys. So the reason that I'm giving this information out in full as to what her injuries were is because her injuries did not go along with the official story. Right. Okay. Hey, I'm going to duck out because I need to go get Bob's medicine. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Okay. So the official story says that she was pistol whipped on the side of the head and she was shot. Nothing really describes how she got the black eye, how she had lacerations and contusions on her lips, and nothing explains how she got the injuries on her shoulder and her neck in that official story of what happened that day. So it does not add up the evidence of what is being told was on her body does not add up to the official story. And as you can see, as we're reading through these, we are contradicting things that we know. Like, we know there was a sheet. Where did this brown blanket come into play? So I guess as we read, we're going to have to keep an eye out for a brown blanket. And maybe Andrea and I just missed that the first few times we read through these documents. I don't know. But it's important for us to point out the contradictions. That's what I'm saying. You know, the injuries that she had does not match what happened in the official story. The story of her and Amanda Pratt making up towards the end. Not from everything I've heard and read. Did they talk at the store? According to Roberta, they did. Hey, Frosty, how's it going? We know that Amanda Pratt made major comments about how she would unalive Tabitha if she had the chance. Um, the blue shirt he spoke of isn't the one in question that we found, right? So what is this blue shirt? Where did they find this blue shirt? Because everything we're being told is she had this gray sweatshirt thing on. So that's another inconsistency. Okay, so 
Thursday night, we're going to continue with the supplemental report. We are on page 44. We have 59 pages total. And then, Mark, when I am in Indiana, the week weekend that I am in Indiana, it would be nice if you and I and Andrea could get on here and do a, a live stream together and just have a chat as far as everything that we've read and talked about so far. The blue shirt was from the house. But they waited two months to search their apartment building. Okay. Thank you, Frosty. I'm trying. He says, of course, Marv is good at teaching about this case. It's tough, you guys. Remembering all this stuff and trying to keep it all... Yeah, the blue shirt was he submitted was wet. I need to look at the pictures because I'm pretty sure that shirt is in the pictures. And we got to find out where it came from. We'll take a look. And then on Thursday, we'll let you know. So, okay, Thursday, we're going to come back. We're going to finish up the supplemental reports. Um, next week, let's see here. What is next week? Next week, I leave on Thursday. So we'll try to get one more episode in of reading more documents. And then while I am gone to Indiana for the Memorial Walk, just so you know, April 5th, 5.30 p.m., Tipton City Park Memorial Walk for Tabitha. Please, please come. You're welcome. Absolutely. That is crazy, Frosty. 300,000 people for the eclipse. That is just crazy. All right. Um, and like I said, Mark, while I'm in tip, or while I'm in Indiana, we need to do a um, a live stream. Have you come on through Zoom or whatever and um, just have a discussion about what we've read so far and go over a few things. All the hotels here are booked. That's crazy. I will be headed back home by then okay but thank you for coming join us again on thursday not tomorrow day after and um we'll continue reading all right have a good night and everyone stay safe bye